Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're taking a look at protein digestion and absorption. We're gonna go through the entire gastrointestinal tract and have a look at where proteins are broken down and where they are absorbed. Let's take a look. All right, to begin, let's orientate ourselves. We have our oral cavity here. We have a salivary gland, not that important for protein digestion. The esophagus, we have the stomach, very important for protein digestion. Then we move through to the duodenum, first part of the small intestines. You can see here at the duodenum, there is a duct that connects the pancreas, liver and gallbladder into the first part of the small intestines. That's important. As we move through into the, uh, the jejunum, which is the next part of the small intestines, we have a range of cells called brush border cells of the small intestines, of the little fingertip-like projections of the small intestines. They release important enzymes. We have an enterocyte. So once we've broken these proteins down into their smallest components, they must be absorbed into the enterocyte and then subsequently absorbed into the bloodstream. We have the apical membrane and the basal membrane, just in case you wanted to know that. Once it's in the bloodstream, this is actually the portal system, the portal vein, which travels to the liver and the liver can decide what it wants to do with those proteins. We're gonna go through this entire process. But to begin, we need to talk about proteins. Now effectively, what we wanna do is break proteins up. We wanna break these proteins up into polypeptides, which are just long chains of amino acids, which can then be broken up into oligopeptides, and then those oligopeptides can be broken up into amino acids. Now there's a couple in between, like you can have dipeptides, tripeptides, things like that. But ultimately we go from proteins to peptides to amino acids. We need this to occur. And these amino acids, these are the smallest units, right? These are the monomers of the proteins that we want to absorb. So when we ingest protein in our diet, we're gonna be introducing it into the oral cavity. And remember that protein is a string of amino acids that has folded in upon itself, right? And forms a three-dimensional structure. And what we have on one end is a carboxyl end. And on the other end, we have the amine end. So that's the carboxyl end, that's the amine end. And here we have our string of amino acids. And you know that the amino acids have different characteristics. Some are acidic, some are basic, some are positive, some are negative. And because of their characteristics, they fold upon themselves because positive things want to be with negative things, hydrophilic things want to face the water, hydrophobic things want to be in the core of the protein. And so it spontaneously folds into this beautiful three-dimensional protein. As this protein moves through, very little, if any, gets digested in the oral cavity. It will move through the esophagus and enter the stomach. Now here in the stomach, we have our three-dimensional protein. Like I said, with our carboxyl end and our amine end. Once it enters the stomach, we have these things called gastric pits. And I've done a video on gastric pits if you wanna know more about the specifics. These gastric pits have a range of cells associated with them. Two important cells you need to be aware of. So we're gonna have a cell here called a chief cell. And we're gonna have a cell here called a parietal cell. Now what happens is this, once the protein enters, it triggers the chief cells to release something called pepsinogen. Pepsinogen, hmm, pepsinogen. Now, I've told you in a previous video, and you may not have remembered, if it ends in O-G-E-N, it means it's inactive. It needs to be activated. That's important because what this is, is a protease. These are the molecular scissors that can chop up proteins. It must be inactive when it's stored because 
Everything's made out of proteins. So if that was active when it was stored, it would start digesting the stomach. So it needs to be released in an inactive form and it needs to get activated. How does it get activated? It gets activated by what gets released from the parietal cell. Now what gets released from the parietal cell is hydrochloric acid. This is what makes the stomach acidic, having its pH between one to three. That's very acidic. So what happens Couple of things. First is this, the acidic environment of the stomach because of the hydrochloric acid will act upon the protein's three dimensional structure. Effectively, it's not the hydrochloric acid, it's what the hydrochloric acid produces, which is free hydrogen ions. And because hydrogen ions have a positive charge, they love negatively charged things. Proteins are abundantly negatively charged. So it starts to try and steal electrons from that protein. And what this does is it unravels that protein because it's changing the characteristics of those amino acids, right? So this is really important. We now go from having this three dimensional protein to now a more linear protein. Still have your amine end, still have your carboxyl end. And again, remember it's a chain of amino acids. I'm not gonna draw them all up, but just to highlight that. So that's what the hydrochloric acid has done. This process is called denaturation. Denaturation. That's an important role of hydrochloric acid. Now, what the hydrochloric acid can do is it can also activate pepsinogen. And it does it by chopping off that O-G-E-N. It chops off that O-G-E-N. And what it ends up producing is pepsin. And pepsin is, like I said, a protease. It's now in its active form. It is molecular scissors. So what it can do is as molecular scissors, it can start chopping. So it starts to chop this protein up. So once we've moved through the stomach because of the actions of hydrochloric acid and pepsin, what we end up having is a couple of polypeptides, for example. Again, still have their carboxyl end, still have their amine end, but they're just smaller. And there are the amino acids, right? Now, once it's in the duodenum, the contents of the stomach, generally you don't just eat proteins in isolation. You'll eat them with other things, often fats, for example. And because there's acid in the stomach, the movement of peptides, acid, and fats into the duodenum triggers some cells that are present in the duodenum. These cells that are present here are called enteroendocrine cells. So I'm just going to do a little asterisk here and put the asterisk here. They are called enteroendocrine cells. And what these enteroendocrine cells do, entero means gut, endocrine means it's releasing chemicals into the bloodstream because that's what it does. The chemical that it releases is something called CCK. Now CCK stands for cholecystokinin. And it's named after what it does to the gallbladder because cholecysto means gallbladder, kinin means to contract. So CCK tells the gallbladder to contract. That's not that important for protein digestion. It is for fats. But what CCK can also do is it travels to the pancreas and it stimulates the pancreas to release its pancreatic juices. And so the pancreas is gonna release its various pancreatic juices. Now importantly, these pancreatic juices include inactive proteases. Remember, pepsinogen was an inactive protease. Now we have more here. What are the various inactive proteases that it's releasing? All right, it releases one called trypsin, trypsinogen. They're horrible names, but let's just go through them. Trypsinogen, what we've got called chymotrypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, procarboxy, no, let's do proelastase first, pro, and I'll show you why in a sec, proelastase, and then procarboxy peptidase. 
Aren't they wonderful names? Pro Carboxy Pep Todays. Pep, Pep. Jeez, I can't talk and write at the same time. Pep Todays. There we go. Sorry about that. All right. These are the four major inactive proteases enzymes that the pancreas releases. Now, how do they get activated? Great question. There are more cells in the duodenum. They're not called enteroendocrine cells. They're called enterokinases. Let's do a different color so you can see it a bit better. Enterokinase. So here we've got an enterokinase. And what enterokinase does, the kinase should indicate to you that it's gonna activate something. Kinases like to activate things. So this enterokinase activates trypsinogen. Turns it into trypsin by chopping off that O-G-E-N. And what trypsin can do is it activates chymotrypsin. It can activate proelastase. It can activate procarboxypeptidase. So it chops off the pro there to create carboxypeptidase, chops off the pro to create elastase, and chops off the OGEN to create chymotrypsin. What do they do? Again, they're just molecular scissors. So effectively what happens is this. Trypsin, chymotrypsin, and proelastase, their job is to start cutting the amino acid bonds inside, so inside the protein, here and here. What procarboxypeptidase does is it chops the end off. It chops the very end off, the last, pro, the last amino acid. So what that means is procarboxypeptidase will produce individual amino acids. They're amino acids. But, pro, but elastase, chymotrypsin and trypsin, they will produce dipeptides and they'll produce tripeptides. So we still need to digest those, right? So carboxypeptidase gave us the amino acids, individual. Elastase, chymotrypsin and trypsin, they give us dipeptides and tripeptides because they don't chop the end. They just chop in the, just inside the protein. So random spots in the middle. They're not random, but let's just say that. All right, now what do we do? We're now in the jejunum and we're at the brush border cells. As we know, brush border cells produce brush border enzymes and the enzymes that these brush border cells produce include something called dipeptidase and amino peptidase. So what dipeptidase and amino peptidase do, dipeptidase chops the dipeptides into amino acid, individual amino acids and amino peptidase chops the ends. But the great thing about chopping the ends off is once I've chopped the ends off the tri, the dipeptidase can chop the rest of it. So what are we left with? We are left with individual amino acids. Brilliant. We have digested our proteins. But now we need to get these amino acids into the enterocyte and from the enterocyte into the portal system to go to the liver so the liver can decide what it wants to do. All right, how does it do it? Well. First thing is this. I spoke about it when I did carbohydrate digestion video, but I'll say it again. In the walls of nearly every cell of our body, so for example, there's some tubular cells of our kidneys that have 50 million of these per cell. They're so abundant. This is called the sodium potassium pump. It uses ATP to throw, and I'll do it in a different color, to throw sodium out of the cell, throws three sodium out of the cell, and throws in two potassium. And what that means is if I'm throwing sodium out, this cell becomes deficient of sodium. So there's a concentration gradient. And as you know, when you ingest foods, those foods can also include sodium, right? That's a mineral, it's an ion. So what happens is this is deficient, sodium wants to go down its concentration gradient and go inside of that cell. And it does this by moving through a channel. So this sodium will move in, down its concentration gradient. That's brilliant. This channel is called a sodium glucose transporter. If you watch my carbohydrate digestion absorption video, this is the same transporter that transports glucose and galactose. So this is a sodium 
glucose transporter. And it's great because it doesn't just transport sodium and glucose and galactose, it transports amino acids too. How good. So we've now just transported amino acids into the cell. Now the thing is, this isn't the only way amino acids can get in. Sometimes dipeptides and tripeptides aren't fully cleaved. And sometimes we can move dipeptides and tripeptides into the cell. And we do this generally, we do this using a channel that shifts hydrogen ions into the cell. And so what can actually piggyback in this process are individual amino acids, they can move through if they want, but also dipeptides can move through and tripeptides can move through. Now you might think, wait a minute, if we're moving them through, don't they need to be digested ultimately to get into the bloodstream? Yeah, they do. So we have uh, peptides inside, uh, not peptides, peptidases, my apologies. We have peptidases inside the cell that will do the rest of the chopping. It will ensure that they are amino acids. So they're the two major mechanisms. Now, we have found complete proteins moving in, complete proteins or larger peptides that have moved in, and they can do this through endocytosis. So another term is phagocytosis. Basically, long peptides can be engulfed by endocytosis. Basically, you get what's called an invagination of the membrane and it blebs off. And then ultimately, it will release the peptide inside. And that peptide will also get broken down by those peptidases. So how do these individual amino acids now get from the enterocyte into the bloodstream? Well, there are a huge amount, a range, at, you know, at least half a dozen of channels that can take peptides and simply allow them to pass down their concentration gradient. So what we call facilitated diffusion. And now what we have uh, our amino acids in our bloodstream, and that can travel to the liver to decide what it needs to do with it. So what we highlighted is this, protein digestion, negligible in the oral cavity. The esophagus is a conduit in the stomach, really important. Chief cells release pepsinogen, parietal cells release hydrochloric acid. The hydrogen ions from the hydrochloric acid denature, unfold that protein. Think about that as a ball of yarn, right? A ball of wool. If you were to get scissors to it, it's really hard to chop. You need to unravel it. That's what the hydrogen ions do. It unravels that protein. Then the hydrochloric acid activates pepsinogen into pepsin. That further chops it down into smaller peptides. These peptides, as it enters the duodenum, trigger the enteroendocrine cells to release CCK, which triggers the pancreas to squeeze its pancreatic juices into the duodenum. These include the four, trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, proelastase, and procarboxypeptidase. To activate, trypsinogen needs to come into contact with enterokinase in the wall of the duodenum. That activates trypsinogen to trypsin, and that activates all the others. Effectively, trypsin, chymotrypsin, and elastase chops internal amino acid bonds. Pro uh, carboxypeptidase chops the ends of the amino acids, and we're left with dipeptides, tripeptides, and amino acids. The dipeptidase and aminopeptidases from the brush border cells finish the job, releasing individual amino acids, and most of them travel through the SGLT, the sodium glucose transporter, along with sodium, glucose, and galactose into the enterocyte. Other transport mechanisms include being, uh, piggybacking with hydrogen ions, or if you're a larger peptide, endocytosis into the cell. Regardless, in the enterocyte, peptidases will chop them up into their individual amino acids, and they'll move through a range of channels that are dedicated just for amino acids. And they, through diffusion, facilitated diffusion, go into the portal system to travel to the liver. I hope you liked that. I hope that made sense. I'm Dr. Mike. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.